Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining our webinar today about rebuilding a drug-free workplace after COVID-19, hosted by DISA and Psychomedics. Just a few things to go over before we get started. All of the attendees will get a copy of the presentation slides along with a copy of the webinar. Please, uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A panel and we'll answer all of them after the webinar in a separate email. Um, and if you're still having trouble with the meeting ID, just keep chatting along with me and I will try and get that resolved. Also, I'm going to launch a poll um, at, when we get further along through the presentation and just go ahead and answer some of those questions so we can get a better idea of where everybody is. Also, there's a quick survey after the webinar just to let us know how we did. With that, I'm going to get started. Our presenters are Alan Johnson, the Vice President of Psychomedics, and our very own Brady Quarles, the AVP of Energy Sales. And we, I will hand it off to Brady to get started. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. Um, once again, this is Brady Quarles from DISA Global Solutions. And, you know, at this point, let's go ahead and get started with the webinar. I'd say uh, to start out, you know, in this post COVID-19 environment that we find ourselves in, it's important for organizations to have a strong and robust drug and alcohol program that meets the needs of the company and the environment that that company works in as well. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Let's go to consequences of drug use in the workplace. As most people know, actions always have consequences. When it comes to drug and alcohol use on the job, the consequences can be costly to a company. In addition to monetary losses, uh, people can hurt, them, hurt themselves or even lose their lives if organizations aren't mitigating risk and working to keep illicit drug and alcohol users out of their organization. As an organization, uh, you're going to want to know what the consequences of drug use in the workplace are and how these actions can affect your company. Uh, so with that, you know, so what are some of these consequences? And so first and foremost, I mean, we're looking at poor work performance. You know, that's always a big one. What does poor work performance look like? I would say inconsistent quality of work, employees with lack of focus, poor decision making. How about increased absenteeism? Individuals that uh, abuse substances are more inclined to call in sick from hangovers or other ailments specific to substance abuse. You know, increased turnover. Substance abusers will have performance challenges and companies will need to move on from these individuals in most cases. <clears throat> How about the other monetary consequences for your organization? You know, we talked about increased turnover. Uh, with increased turnover, you also have to talk about the increased time and money it takes to train or, and onboard their replacements. So next theft. Illicit drug users will often resort to stealing in order to uh, support a habit. Substance abuse can make decent people make poor decisions, so always be mindful of that. In fact, you know, and also continue, make sure you continue to uh, drug test people after they're hired. Lastly, accidents. You know, accidents can lead to a loss of life and or equipment. Any actions that impact a person's judgment, alertness, perception, motor coordination, or even like emotional state should be mitigated. Next slide. The cost of drugs in the workplace. With this slide, we wanted to show the group what illicit drug and alcohol use costs companies on a national level. Additionally, we'll answer the question about if drug and alcohol abuse is a factor in work-related fatalities. Let's look at costs. U.S. companies lose over $100 billion annually on drug and alcohol-related abuse. If 17% of the workforce is considered substance abusers, each abuser costs their company about $7,000 a year. As a number of people know on this webinar, the company that I work for, DISA, we, we cater to safety-sensitive organizations. DISA believes that illicit drug users in a safety-sensitive setting will cost their companies even more. We think the annual cost per year is somewhere probably more like 35K annually for safety-sensitive users. Uh, that's, that's a big difference there. You know, we're talking about a 400% increase from the normal non-safety-sensitive workplace estimation. Lastly, can substance abuse increase fatalities in the workplace? 
the answer is yes. You know, 40% of all industrial workplace fatalities are caused by substance abusers. In addition, 10 to 20% of all fatalities in the workplace result in a positive drug and alcohol test. Next slide. Trends leading to COVID. In the previous slides, we talked about the consequences of drug and alcohol use. You know, later on in the presentation, we'll talk about a number of other factors contributing to the increase of illicit drug use in our society. Uh, but you know, what are we seeing? You know, the percentages, the percentage of individuals using drugs uh, is much higher in 2017 and 2018 than what we even saw in 2014 and 2015. 53.2 million Americans over the age of 12 have admitted to being past drug users. That's about 19.4% of our population. Another way to look at the fact is one out of every five individuals that you know over the age of 12 um, you know, has admitted to being you know, using illicit drugs. Very alarming to say the least. So at this point uh, in the next section of the webinar, Alan Johnson from Psychomedics will be speaking to the group about uh, substance abuse and how it's affected uh, in times of crisis. Take it away, Alan. Uh, thank you, Brady, I appreciate that. So we're gonna take a look, and, and we did take a look at what we could learn from the past uh, to help us maybe be ready for the future. And, and the future being as we get into the post-COVID workplace, uh, what we should look for in terms of behavioral impacts in terms of substance abuse, uh, increasing substance abuse, and, and more, most importantly, maybe the, the new threats uh, that we can expect to see uh, on the horizon, given the data that both DISA and Psychomatics collect uh, on, on drug use over time. Uh, if we move to the next slide, Ashley, I looked at three different events, and the first one we're gonna look at is the Vietnam War. And as you can see here, uh, Department of Defense study uh, showed that a significant number of soldiers in the Vietnam War were self-medicating, and, and this was purely related to uh, the struggles uh, that they had on the battlefield, uh, the fear of not knowing what was coming next, uh, being in an extended period of, of trauma, uh, and, and maybe most importantly, the average age of a soldier in Vietnam was 22, and that was down four years from the average age of a soldier uh, in World War II. So you had young people that were in uh, very isolated environments away from family and friends, uh, high, high stress, high trauma, and a lot of self-medication. Next event that we looked at uh, as a historical perspective uh, was 9-11. So I'm looking at 9-11. Uh, there were some interesting uh, polls and studies that were done by the National Institutes of Health and the New York Academy of Medicine. And what they found was that in the days immediately following the event, uh, there was a, a, a significant uptick in what we would refer to probably as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, same thing that soldiers would have on the battlefield. Uh, and they came back after a few months, and what they found was, although those, those levels of PTSD had dropped back to normal levels, the substance abuse that accompanied those, uh, those incidents stayed the same. So effectively what happened was people picked up new habits during the crisis and they didn't lose them when the crisis had passed. So they had exacerbated existing um, dependencies or they'd started uh, new to chemical dependencies post-event. That carried forward another few years. Uh, we look at New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. If you look at Katrina, it was an interesting event because it was a bit different perspective. The Louisiana Hospital Board studied the overdose statistics, admissions to hospitals pre-Katrina and post-Katrina. And what they found was that after Katrina, those hospitalizations went up a significant percentage. And not only that, they extended across a broader demographic range. So more people across a broader de demographic range were self-medicating, some for the first time, resulting in overdoses that required hospitalization. So if we look at those three events on balance, we see sort of a, a pattern in human behavior in times of high stress. And we wanna look forward and say, how does COVID resemble those three events? It's pretty similar. You've got extended periods of stress. You've got isolation from family, isolation from friends, isolation from workplaces. And you really don't know what's gonna happen next. And all of that manifests itself in a kind of a deep seated fear uh, that causes at least some people to resort to chemicals and self-medicate. So we look at the next slide. One of the things that's really interesting is a, is a closing data point here. We looked at 
uh, some of the findings of the Betty Ford Center. And it was, it was interesting when you looked at and you, you kind of held up these findings against what we looked at during the Vietnam conflict, during 9-11, during Hurricane Katrina, what you saw was this whole thing of this whole sense of isolation that we're going through now, uh, which is probably more pronounced than it was in those three events, is a prime trigger for addiction. So I think what we're looking at as we, as we look at the post-COVID workplace, uh, we need to think about people that are going to come back potentially with new dependencies or dependencies that have been exacerbated by the conditions they've been under uh, for the past several years or uh, several months. I'm going to transition this back to Brady, and I want to mention as we, as we think about some of the data we're going to look at next, think back on these three examples that we just looked at, and I think maybe a lot of these things will come into context about what we should look for and why. Brady? Yeah, thank you. So moving forward, let's go ahead and start with marijuana facts and figures. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, marijuana use, uh, you know, it's up 16%. In states that have legalized marijuana, the rates are even higher. Uh, so let's take Colorado, for example. Positivity rates in this state have increased uh, up to 20%. Washington State has increased 23%. In order to start our discussion on marijuana, I want to reiterate uh, that the challenge of managing a drug-free workforce will become more difficult with the further legalization of marijuana. Alcohol is legal, but the substance still has its effects on the workforce. Marijuana is the same. Make sure that marijuana use and being under the influence of a substance is prohibited in your policy. Why should you prohibit? You know, marijuana, like alcohol, has a number of side effects. The side effects consist of disorientation, confusion, uh, attention deficits, euphoria, dysphoria, impaired memory, and even blurred vision. All the side effects that we've talked about um, could lead to major issues in work environments, especially in safety sensitive environments. Next slide. Marijuana public opinion. In the next slides, you know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make it a point to you that people's thoughts and beliefs about specific drugs are evolving. The evolution of these thoughts and beliefs make your job of managing your drug and alcohol program more challenging. In 1969, only 12% of all adults supported the legalization of marijuana. Since then, support uh, for legalization has increased uh, to like 66 percent and that was based off of uh, 2019 numbers so let's take a look at the graph a little bit in the horizontal axis you know we have the the age groups in the vertical axis uh, what we're looking at is percentage of people that support the legalization of marijuana uh, when i look at takeaways from this you know first and foremost you know the younger you are the most likely you are to support legalization surprise surprise you know lastly just you know looking at the steady climb from 1969 to 2019 the percentage of americans that support legalization have increased by 50, you know, basically 54%. And that's been in the last 50 years alone. Who knows what these numbers will look like in the future? You know, make sure that your company is prepared uh, for these specific changes. Next slide. Yeah. Marijuana present day. As you look at the map of the United States, it's important to know that you're, you're looking at a legend. You know, the, the legend is broken down in a number of different categories, ranging from legalized to fully illegal. Looking at this map, you know, the state that deems marijuana fully illegal is represented by the color white. Uh, the darker colored states represent states that have some form of marijuana legalization. So, you know, first of all, going back three or four years ago, most of this map would be, you know, represented by the color white. So now what are we looking at? You know, the entire West Coast is legalized and the East Coast isn't that far behind. In addition, almost all states minus a few have some form of acceptance. Uh, we'll see what the next slide, you know, uh, what the future holds in the next slide. Marijuana is on the ballot. <laughs> What will the United States uh, map look like in the future? More and more states are moving to legalizing marijuana in some form. In the near future, four states are expected to vote on legalizing cannabis uh, for adults over 21. These states are Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota. In addition, other states like Idaho, Mississippi, and Nebraska are looking to establish medical cannabis programs. Next slide. It's not just marijuana. Earlier in the webinar, we spoke about the consequences of drug and alcohol abuse and how the further legalization of marijuana will 
make managing your program more challenging. Unfortunately, there are other drugs besides marijuana that will make your job more difficult. Um, opioids are another issue. Uh, so everyone knows an opioid is a legal pharmaceutical that is used primarily in pain relief, and the substance is also used in anesthesia as well, I believe. On a national level, over 2 million people are estimated to have a problem with opioids. Painkillers uh, are a growing problem in our nation. 33% of all Americans use painkillers in 2017. <clears throat> as a reminder, drug abuse also costs citizens money as well, not just companies. Addressing the impact of substance use alone is estimated to cost the American people over $740 billion each year. Next slide. Prescription drug abuse in the is a national problem. In order to provide you a visual of how concerning the opioid epidemic is, we have another US map to review that will shine a light on opioid abuse in 2017. Before I start, I wanna let, let the group know that you know, I was very surprised by the information provided in the slide. As we see in the legend, you know, what we're looking at is we're looking at the number of opioid prescriptions per every 100 people by state. So we're tracking states that average, you know, less than 64 prescriptions per 100 people. Uh, states that are between 64 to 82 prescriptions per 100 people, states that are between 83 and 107 prescriptions per 100, uh, per 100 people, and finally states that <clears throat> had more than 107 prescriptions per 100 people. You know, looking at the map, my initial expectations were the, you know, most states in this would you know, fall in the 64 prescription range or so. You know, obviously it, it wasn't the case. You know, what are we learning from this information? You know, what do we learn from you looking at the map? I mean, it is apparent that the, excuse me, it is apparent that these certain areas like the Southeast and the Northwest regions of the United States are having major issues with opioids. How about Alabama? For every 100 citizens, there are over 107 prescriptions out there. Um, how does that happen? I'll assume that individuals are obtaining multiple prescriptions from multiple sources. You know, the only thing I can say there is, you know, be better Alabama, but that's, uh, that's, that's crazy, you know, for every 100 people, you're gonna have over 107 prescriptions for those representing those individuals. Next slide. <clears throat> Opioid epidemic has led to a rise in amphetamine use. In 2018, the national media and our politicians started to point out the effects that opioids were having on our society. With the spotlight now in the opioid epidemic drug abuse behaviors, you know, they, they've changed somewhat. You know, doctors have started to become more cautious in, you know, their prescription habits. Access to opioids have become much harder to obtain. What did drug abusers do? You know, abusers didn't just stop using. You know, they looked for other drugs like amphetamines to satisfy their habit. You know, what is an amphetamine? You know, amphetamine is a legal pharmaceutical primarily used to treat health problems such as obesity, narcolepsy, and ADHD. You know, since 10, 2018, amphetamines have resulted in more positive drug tests than cocaine and opioids. That's, that's surprising. Mm -hmm. For a quick review of the graph uh, that focuses on the percentage of DISA's positivity rates uh, for the years ranging from 2017 to 2019, we see that certain drug positivity rates are on the rise and others are decreasing. For instance, cocaine. Cocaine positives are decreasing. More than likely, drug users are moving to other drugs that are easier, like, e easier attained, like pharmaceutical drugs, example, opioids and amphetamines. Also, let's look at opioids. Uh, at its peak in 2018, opioids accounted for 17% of all DISA's positive drug tests. By 2019, opioid positives had dropped by, you know, to 14%. Why? Once again, in my mind, doctors became more cautious and their prescription practices changed. Um, one, and what's that's from? And the spotlight was on them from the media as well from the politicians as well. <laughs> These opioid abusers in 2018 more than likely shifted their drug use to other easily attained pharmaceuticals like amphetamines. In fact, the graph supports the notion after 2017, we see a sharp rise in the percentage of positives at DISA. Amphetamines accounted for 20% of all of DISA's positives in 2018 and 2019. Next slide. COVID-19 has accelerated amphetamine and opioid use. 
Uh, so our last slide left off in 2019 talking about how opioid use was decreasing and amphetamine use was increasing. What about looking into the what, what happens when you introduce a global pandemic into the mix um, of the challenging landscapes pertaining to drug and alcohol use in America? You know, looking at the chart, we will focus on DISA's year over year number of positive random drug tests between the peak COVID timeframes of April through July for 2020. Uh, we'll compare those positivity rates uh, to the 2019 positivity rates uh, at the same time. So looking here, let's look at uh, marijuana. So when we compare uh, the numbers for 2019 and 2020, uh, marijuana is up 14%. How about cocaine? We've talked about that already. Cocaine is down 33% from 2019 to 2020 from April to July. Opioids, wow, 436% increase. Uh, that's amazing. Amphetamines, another pharmaceutical drug that's easily attainable, uh, up 250%. Let's look at other, for example. So we see that other right now um, is up 1,281%. Just so you, uh, everyone knows, uh, other is representing buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a drug that is used in opioid addiction treatment. Uh, like any drug, dependence is a side effect uh, on this drug as well, and it can be abused. Okay. And it's now slowing down and it's not slowing down. <clears throat> what we're looking at on this side is year over year positivity rates for opioids and amphetamines. Uh, the graphs focus on the peak COVID months of April, May, June, and July, like the previous slide, uh, it is also looking at, you know, at specifics before 2019 to 2020. As a reminder, 2019 was a year without crisis to where 2020 has been plagued by the global pandemic. What happens to positivity rates for pharmaceuticals that are easily obtained in our post pandemic environment? You know, let's take a look real quick. Um, starting at the far left, we can uh, focus on opioids. You know, in April from 2019 to 2020, we're looking at a 405% increase. May's more of the same, 437% increase. June gets really high at 605% increase. And July, uh, we're looking at 573%. Next, let's look at amphetamines. Uh, for April, we're looking at 241% increase. May, 240% increase. June, 277% increase. And July is 299% increase. We don't have the numbers as of yet for August, but I can guarantee you that they're gonna be going the same way upwards. Next slide. Understanding your options. Let's go to uh, drug testing methodologies. There are different methods uh, used for drug testing. These methods differ in terms of cost, accuracy, intrusiveness, and where they can be administered. Each test looks at chemical met metabolites or traces that a drug leaves behind after it's eliminated from your body. You know, the three main drug testing methods that DESA specializes in is urinalysis, hair, and oral fluid. Methodologies differ in many ways, but all types of testing have common denominators in what they're testing for. As an organization, you want to have a clear view of what kind of substances that you're screening for. Uh, when looking at drug testing policies, you'll notice that the testing, tested substances are usually classified as panels. The term panel refers to the drug or, or family of drugs included in a drug test. For example, the panel of like opioids includes morphine, codeine, and her heroin. The, the more panels a test includes, the greater the scope of the test. So that's always a good thing. Uh, panels can also include added uh, substances known as markers into the testing. As an example, semi-synthetic opioids such as oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, and hydromorphone have been included in the opioid testing family of testing. So looking at the screen real quick, you have two options here. We're comparing a five panel drug test to a 10 panel. Uh, for a five panel drug test, just so you know, in 1989, the Department of Transportation required certain job functions to actually test a certain way. What the Department of Transportation did actually choose is a five panel, as you see it right here. Um, but, you know, if you're an organization that is looking to create a corporate policy, you know, we, we suggest that you actually 
be tested for many drugs as possible. So we do you know, suggest at least a 10 panel. What is the 10 panel? The 10 panel is basically the five panels that was uh, required by the Department of Transportation. And what we're doing is, is we're adding a number of pharmaceuticals like barbiturates, benzodiazepines, propoxyphene, and methadone. Historical testing data for the standard drug panels. <clears throat> so first and foremost, what we'll do, we'll kind of read through this, a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, let's take urinalysis, for example. Uh, five panel urine test that could be a DOT test. Pre-employment positivity rates, with what we see here at DSA is a 1.72%. The randoms right at 1%. Uh, the number one drug that's detected uh, in urine is marijuana, and you'll see that for the 10 panel as well. Um, how about the positivity rates for the 10 panel? Uh, the pre-employment positivity rate is right at 3% and the random rate is right at 1% once again. Um, but let's take a look at hair, okay? So we have a five panel hair test. The pre-employment positivity rate is 7.3%. Wow, that's huge. Um, random, 1.04%. One other thing that we see here is the number one drug that's detected by this uh, methodology is cocaine. Uh, next, uh, 11 panel oral fluid tests. Um, what we'll see here is, you know, the positivity rates for oral fluid. Um, you're right, right around 1% at pre-employment. And lastly, for randoms, about 0.23%. Some of the highlights from this, you know, I guess some of the takeaways that I would talk about is the increase of the positivity rate when you go from a five to 10 panel year analysis is high. So testing for more drugs almost always leads to higher positivity rates. Uh, if you decide to go with urine, you know, DISA recommends at least at minimum, you know, like a 10 panel. Uh, if allowed, of course, you know, once again, if the employees fall under DOT regulations, they will need to test under the DOT five panel. How about the pre-employment positivity rates for hair testing? Hair testing is a great methodology for the detection of drugs that metabolize quickly. One example of drugs that metabolize quickly is obviously it's cocaine, you know, with hair testing substances like cocaine, amphetamines and opioids will have higher positivity rates than marijuana. Next slide. So what we're looking at on this slide is the detection windows for a few of the standard drug testing methodologies used uh, in employee screening. So first and foremost, you have uh, you know, urinalysis, uh, basically the detection window for urinalysis at zero to seven days. Oral fluid, your detection window is anywhere from two hours to a few days. Blood testing, blood testing is not normally used in normal testing situations due to its intrusiveness but it can be used in post-accident situations. Blood testing provides immediate detection up to a few days as well. Next, uh, we'll talk about hair testing, which provides a long-term detection window. The detection window for hair is about a week to 90 days. Hair provides organizations with a lifestyle view of the applicant or the employee. The methodology identifies illicit drug users versus the casual user. In addition, other advantages to hair are resistance to, to evasion, uh, so, so, you know, an individual can beat a urine test by abstaining from using a few, you know, for a few days, not with hair. Hair samples cannot be substituted, adulterated, or diluted. Another advantage for hair is it's non-intrusive for sample collection. Hair collection can be performed in minutes. Uh, hair is 100% observed, uh, and you don't need a special environment for collection like urine. Lastly, you know, like all methodologies, hair testing it has its advantages and disadvantages. You know, one disadvantage, is, one disadvantage to hair testing is that it's not really a great methodology for situations to where you're trying to identify if someone is currently under the influence. Example, these are like post-accident situations and reasonable suspicion situations. You know, hair testing will not you know, tell you if someone is under the influence. Uh, DISA recommends a combination of a short-term and long-term methodology when creating a robust substance abuse program. For more information on hair testing, I'll put it back to Alan. Yeah, thanks, Brady. I appreciate it. Um, next, you go to the next slide, uh, Ashley. What I'm going to do is give you a little bit of detail uh, uh, on some trends that we see and also a little bit about uh, hair testing that you may or may not know. Um, first, I want to mention the, um, the two data points that we've got here. If you look at the, the DEA data, the National Drug Threat Assessment that they do once a year, which is a great 
uh, piece of, of collateral that you can get your hands on. If, if uh, I think my email address will be at the end of this presentation. If you want this or anything else that you see here, uh, be sure and drop me a note and I'll get it to you. But in the, the, the takeaways out of this is that the threat profile has changed. Uh, as, as you saw Brady talk about amphetamines, methamphetamines, that class of drugs that we call psychostimulants, uh, which include methamphetamines and cocaine, it's getting worse. And as you look through the report, you'll see it's getting worse, worse not just in any particular region, uh, but across virtually every region that the DEA has offices in the U.S. And so uh, if we look at the three takeaways that I pulled here, cocaine being a resurgent threat, kind of in line with what you see on the right-hand side, the red arrows, uh, the data that we've measured in our laboratory between 2013 and 19. And one of the obvious questions might be, um, you know, why do you see an increase between those years? And, and these are a bit of a decrease in the last couple of years. Well, the time periods are slightly different, 2013 to 19. But as Brady said, uh, the cocaine, uh, or the, uh, the hair test and how we run those tests tends to detect cocaine uh, at a much higher rate uh, than you would ever detect it with a urine test. So um, that's one of those things. If you look at the data on the right-hand side, one of the things that we found was both white and blue collar workers across the board, uh, we saw these trends developing. Cocaine and amphetamines on the rise, opioids and marijuana in, in decline. Marijuana more static, uh, but certainly opioids for all the reasons that Brady talked about, becoming more difficult to get uh, on, on, uh, on the wane. The thing to be aware of as you start looking at some of the trends that may, may uh, see after, after the COVID uh, crisis passes and we're back at work, fentanyl is being sold as counterfeit prescription pills and it really is uh, at a high mortality rate for people that overdose on it. And we're starting to see more fentanyl uh, show up as counterfeit Xanax, Percocet, uh, starting to cut into even street marijuana and coming across the border. Uh, from Mexico. Uh, and so it's something to keep an eye on. It's something to watch for. Uh, it's something that we do test for and something that we'll continue to test for as we move into 2021. Uh, next slide. And what I want to talk about here is sort of our collective challenge, which you know, how do we rebuild that drug-free workplace um, after we, we all come back? You know, we've, we've talked about some of the trends. I think that, you know, human behavior being the same uh, generation on generation we can expect that we are going to see an uptick, and the data is already starting to show that, uh, in positive rates on certain drugs. Uh, the question is, which drugs and what do we do about it? We've actually authored a, a booklet that you can also, if you, if you want to uh, send me an email, I can send back to you, Rebuilding a Workplace After COVID. A lot of the data that Brady and I are talking about here, you'll find inside that booklet. Uh, but the real key here is, as we look at rebuilding the workplace, deterrence is going to be a key. Deterring people uh, from either applying if they're drug users or deterring employees from using drugs when they come back uh, through fear of, of detection. That's really the business that we're in is, is providing that certainty of detection that builds a deterrence wall uh, between users and drugs. If you'll go to the next slide, please, Ashley, I'd appreciate it. And I want to talk about that here. First, we know we all know the, the uh, the positive benefits, Brady talked about some of the, the negatives of drug use, the cost to businesses and all that. So we know that anything we do to slow that trend uh, results in the inverse of that, which are the positives. And you can see those on the right-hand side. And I think most of you probably already know those. The thing I want to spend some time on here is on the left. And if you look at this, these are, this is a cross-industry view of positive rates over time between one and nine years uh, when people started hair testing. So the numbers here really don't lie. You, you start out with high positive rates, which is fairly typical for a company just starting out, and you see those decline over time. What's really interesting though, and we just had a webinar about two weeks ago uh, with some trucking firms, and what they saw, uh, as you heard Brady mention earlier, DOT mandating uh, urine testing for certain things, they saw their urine rates fall. So their post-accident urine rates and their random urine rates went down when they started testing with hair. They started seeing positive impact on their, their post-accident and random testing uh, when drivers that they were hiring, and in this case, employees that are being hired uh, for other businesses, find out that the certainty of detection has increased. You'll, see, you'll tend to see some people leave a job. You'll tend to see applicants that might be bad fits because of drug use not apply when they find out that you're hair test, but you'll certainly see 
a reduction in positive rates over time. That's a certainty. If you'll go to the next slide. Part of what drives that, and, and Brady talked about it uh, beautifully here a minute ago, is just the window detection. If you look at the windows of detection, uh, really it's fit the drug testing method to the purpose that you're testing for. And if it is post-accident, or it's uh, some other uh, you know, fit, fit for duty or, or return to duty, return to work, and you wanna find out in the moment if someone is, is on any kind of drug, certainly there are some other technologies that are better for that. If you're looking for lifestyle users and you're looking for people that know how to skirt an applicant test uh, for urine or, or to know that um, maybe the random isn't quite as random uh, as you would think and they, they sort of knew they were on the, the list to be checked, for whatever reason, being able to evade that test, really not possible when you're testing with hair unless somebody stays clean for over 90 days. Uh, that's really the key is being able to take that long window back, take a look at that sample, that hair sample, which carries sort of a tape recording of drug usage over time, and then uh, determine uh, what's been used. The other thing to mention here is that because of that long window of detection, we're able to pick up those water-soluble drugs, the cocaines, the opioids, the amphetamines, much, much better um, and, and uh, for, the, for the, the usage over time uh, than you would be able to with some alternative technologies. If you go to the next slide, please. So let's talk about the collection uh, just a little bit. You know, obviously, I, as, as uh, Brady said, there are times and places and for, for every kind of drug testing method. Uh, the one thing as we talk about sort of the days that we're in now, uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, the collection method because people are looking for something that's pretty sanitary. Um, there are facilities that need to be cleaned pretty frequently and, and, um, and guidance from CDC and guidance from different places about uh, proper uh, proper sanitation, proper uh, methods, proper processes. The, the simple the simple collection procedure uh, for the hair sample is really appealing right now. It's, it's pretty straightforward. This is not a hair follicle test. Hair is not plucked from the scalp. It's actually, as you see there, trimmed just above the scalp. And the sample size is, is relatively small. It's about an inch and a half long, gives you a 90 day view of drug usage. And when you get the sample and twist it in your fingers, it should be no bigger than the size of a toothpick or a number two pencil lid. It should be really small. Uh, so that cosmetically, there's, there's really not much in the way at all of, of a cosmetic appearance of, of having your hair uh, shaved or your head shaved or anything like that. Head hair or body hair, either uh, when, you, when you do a psychometrics test, uh, taken from the rear of the head, no face-to-face -face interactions, uh, no, samples, no, simple, or no sample storage, Nothing that would bring uh, extent, any kind of, uh, of sanitation concerns into the mix. So that's a little bit of a snapshot on sort of the, the trends that we see, a little bit of a snapshot on why we find certain drugs we find, and a little bit of the, of the snapshot on the process itself. And I'm gonna turn it back to Brady to talk about building an effective policy. Thanks, Alan. You wanna to go to the next slide? So building your policy, you know, determining drug testing needs. Um, the first step of building a drug policy for an organization is to identify the methodology or methodologies that are needed in order to meet the organization's desired result. So federal reg regulations might require you to test a certain way in some situations, but your, your drug program could consist of multiple policies with different methodologies, you know, used at different times once again. Uh, so, you know, the most common methodologies in drug testing are urinalysis, hair, and oral fluid. DISA recommends using a combination of a short-term and a long-term detection methodology in order to create multiple barriers uh, to keep illicit drug users out of your organization. Once again, when we talk about short-term drug, drug detection, you can be identified by using urine or oral fluid. Long-term detection can be identified by using hair testing. Next, your organization will need to identify identify and determine what type of test purposes will be needed. Uh, to name just a few here, you have pre-employment. You know, pre-employment testing is when you screen applicants and future employees um, before they come aboard. Offers almost always hinge on, you know, on the results of these types of tests. Using a long-term methodology like HAIR to detect habitual users is always recommended at pre-employment. How about random testing? You know, will your organization randomly test your employees? DISA suggests that you randomly 
test all of your employees. Higher random percentages are always recommended for safety sensitive job functions in our eyes. So why randoms? You know, in my mind, a random drug test is the biggest deterrent that a drug program can have. If John Doe knows that he won't be tested again after the pre-employment process, he basically has a green light to use drugs in the future. And that's not what you want as an organization. How about reasonable suspicion? Reasonable suspicion uh, testing is also known for for calls drug testing and it's performed when a supervisor you know has evidence of reasonable or reasonable calls to suspect that an employee is using illicit drugs evidence is based upon direct observation either by a supervisor or another employee i guess one last reason reason to test uh, that I'll talk about is post-accident testing. Post-accident uh, drug testing is performed after an employee has been involved in a workplace accident. This type of testing is used to determine whether drugs were a factor in that incident. incident. So to touch base on another best practice, uh, make sure that your organization is sending all tests to labor uh, labor for, in for laboratory analysis. Sending your specimen to a SAMHSA FDA and CAP certified laboratory will save you in the long run with any potential legal litigations coming from those drug tests. Also, specimens should always be sent to a medical review officer. A medical review officer, an MRO, is a person who is licensed physician and who is responsible for receiving and reviewing laboratory results generated by the employer's drug testing program. Uh, one other note, the medical review officer will determine if a positive drug test was due to illicit drug, drug use or not. Lastly, make sure your, your policy includes information pertaining to process for fitness for duty and return to work is also a must. Legal language that defines safety sensitive positions is also a good idea to have. Next, step two a clearly written policy. <clears throat> as, you'll, as you'll see, this slide is a little bit of an eye chart, so I won't uh, speak to everything. You know, long story short, your drug policy needs to be clear and concise about what behaviors are prohibited. For example, alcohol and marijuana there are, are legal in some instances, but you want to make sure that you prohibit the use of the substance at your place of work. Also, make it clear in the policy that employees shouldn't be under the influence of substances while at work as well. Next, Make sure that the parameters of the drug testing programs are included in the policy. So questions to ask, you know, how is the company testing? We've already talked about different methodologies. Uh, you know, we definitely recommend using multiple methodologies. That way you have a short-term detection a methodology and a, a, a long-term detection methodology as well. Also, when does your company test? I mean, we've talked about that as well. Pre-employment, random testing, post-accident. Um, those are questions that you know, need to be answered. <clears throat> um, what drugs do your organization, what, what drugs does your organization test for? Marijuana, opioids, cocaine, amphetamines, these are all some. Are you using a five panel, a 10 panel, or 11 panel? <laughs> you know, DISA recommends that you test uh, for as many drugs as possible in your, your non-DTA programs. <laughs> Next. What are the consequences of uh, policy violations for your organization? Um, will you allow rehab and let employees come back to work once they have completed return to duty testing? Or does your organization believe zero tolerance? Zero tolerance essentially means that rehab is allowed and a positive drug test will lead to determination for that employee. Lastly, for this slide, an organization needs to determine if a medical disclosure policy is needed. A medical disclosure you know, requires employees to self-identify to the employers what medications that might be you know, in their system before they're sent out into the workforce. Medical disclosure policies for safety-sensitive positions are important. You know, once again, illegal and legal drug drugs could pose a threat to the workplace safety. If you don't already have a medical disclosure policy in place, you may be opening yourself up to legal drug use on the job in your safety sensitive positions, and that's not good. <laughs> Next, uh, employee education training. As an organization with a newly created policy, what's next? Once the policy has been created, it's important that your employees are educated on the specifics of the policy. You know, in many cases, HR teams will perform policy reviews for their employees. You know, policy updates will also need to be had when changes are made uh, to your current testing policy. 
you know, companies can also provide specific trainings that will provide education material, you know, for their employees. You know, one example is, is for your employees training. You know, I would recommend an employee awareness training for all employees. Employees need to know what substances and actions are prohibited while on the job. Most importantly, you know, they, they need to know what are the consequences of violating the policy with positive tests or even at a refusal to test. How about supervisors? You know, supervisor awareness training is important. Giving your supervisors the knowledge to how to identify illicit drug and alcohol abuse is vital. You know, also educating the supervisor on program processes and procedures, including documentation requirements, you know, are a must. You know, lastly, it's always a good idea to have your employees sign off on the policy for verification uh, that they have reviewed and they understand the consequences of the policy. Even when small changes are made to a current policy, a signature sometimes could be, a, you know, could be needed or should be uh, obtained. Wow, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of material here, I would say to conclude, I'd say developing, you know, and managing a drug and alcohol program can be challenging. You know, as the drug use in America evolves in times of crisis, your organization programs need to be able to evolve and adapt with the changing times. You know, hopefully we provided you with information that will help in your future screening challenges. You know, thanks uh, for your time and have a good day. Does anybody else have anything else to say? I think, um, uh, actually, I think there was a question from someone that, that I'd, I'd like to answer for him here, which is a simple one. And the question was, can you do both hair and urine testing on an individual? And, and of course, and as Brady would tell you, the answer is yes. Um, and you can do either or both. Uh, and in fact, we just did a webinar, as I mentioned earlier, about three weeks ago, I think it is now, uh, with three vice presidents of safety that do exactly that. They, they run both tests. and. Um, uh, you'll be, you can find that on our website, or probably the easiest thing to do uh, is to send me an email, uh, whoever this was that asked the question. Uh, you can see my, my email address here. Uh, send an email and I'll, I'll get you the uh, uh, link to get to that, that discussion. Um, good question, though, and yes, you can, you can test with both on an individual. Brady, you want to add anything? Uh, that's all I have. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I sh published the uh, poll result results, if you can see those, just, just to kind of get a better understanding of what everybody else's opinion or thoughts are on uh, random programs, what your company's doing, which, which of the drugs you thought were water-soluble. Alan, do you want to tell everybody what the right answers were? <laughs> well, I think most everybody got it. Uh, opioids, amphetamines, cocaine. Um, being the uh, the water soluble drugs uh, that are uh, you know the the ones that, that typically you would use hair to detect uh, pretty effectively, and, um, and you know I, I uh, I'm I'm glad to see that everybody seemed to know what those were. Yes, and uh, the majority of our attendees answered no to um, expecting higher positivity rates when they return to work, and seventy one percent of the attendees have neither halted or customized their random program. And I'm, I should have probably asked if they have a random program or not. But um, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. All of the other questions that were asked, we're going to reply via email. And if you have any other questions, you can email Brady or Alan. And we uh, will be sending you the slides and presentation hopefully tomorrow, if not Monday. But that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining.